It is really good to, to be with you this evening. Um, Acham and I felt it was um, really important to share together um, in looking at uh, Muslim prison chaplaincy, because as you'll discover uh, during the talk, um, Muslim prison chaplaincy very much sits within the context of prison chaplaincy as a whole. And what we hope to do is introduce um, prison chaplaincy as it is across all the faith traditions. And then Acham will speak um, specifically about um, the work um, of a Muslim chaplain, but within that context um, of chaplaincy um, across um, all the faith traditions within multi-faith teams. Just a, a very brief introduction um, to the prison service um, in England and Wales. Um, 142 prisons, um, the Scottish and Northern Ireland services is separately managed, um, so Acham and I and, and the National Offender Management Service is for England and Wales. Um, there are different categories of prison, um, from CAT A, um, which is the um, high security um, end of the prison estate, um, through down to, um, to CAT D. Um, prisons which are preparing people um, to leave and go into the community. We also have um, open um, prisons for, for women and for young offenders. So there's a whole range um, of prisons within the estate. Um, the prison service is divided into a number of regions, um, each of uh, which is looked after by a um, deputy director of custody. Um, and uh, they have oversight of the delivery of service within those regions. And the headquarters function um, for the service as a whole is at Clive House, um, which is where Acham and I find ourselves some of the time um, with our chaplaincy HQ team. And if you want to know more about that, we'll happily pick that up um, in the questions. That's the, um, the public sector. Um, there's also a number of private sector prisons, uh, private providers, um, and that section um, at the moment is, is fairly stable, um, but we, we might see um, another private prison um, in due course. But at the moment, um, that's, that's the, uh, the picture from the private estate. So what I hope to convey um, in this introduction is very much that prison chaplains together are partners in a shared endeavour, which is the delivery of faith and pastoral services um, to prisoners and staff in prison. Prison chaplaincy originally really goes back in its present form to um, 1773, when it was possible for justices of the peace uh, to employ a salaried chaplain. And at that time, it would have been very much uh, an Anglican chaplain, it would have been an Anglican priest who was employed to deliver divine service. And there was a whole sort of history um, that, that went on to, I suppose, the next sort of major point was the 1952 Prison Act, um, which um, mandated that each prison would have an Anglican chaplain and that the chaplain would undertake a variety of duties that we'll talk about um, a little later. But there was provision for visiting ministers um, for, the, um, for communities other than the, um, the Anglican church. And then the prison rules in 1999 reiterated that. And it's interesting in the Prison Act, and it's still on statute, a prison can't open without a governor and a chaplain. Um, so chaplaincy is still very much woven into um, the fabric um, of prison life. Over the past um, 15 years, there's been a real move away from very much uh, sort of Anglican and then Christian chaplaincy um, to multi-faith working, um, which is very much a legacy of a number of chaplains. But key to that change was my predecessor, William Noblet, um, who served as chaplain general and really worked very hard uh, to change the culture within prison chaplaincy. And that gives um, the numbers of employed chaplains um, and sessional chaplains covering all um, the, the faith communities represented um, in prison. And we're happy to pick up any questions about that at the end. Um, the last part of, I'm just learning how to use this. One thing that's very much worth um, pointing out is the value of chaplaincy volunteers, um, 7,000 um, at the last count. And that's something hopefully we can pick up in questions because it's a very important part of what chaplaincy offers.
Yes. Has it gone? Yes. <laughs> As I say, the, the, the Prison Act um, appointed the possibility of um, the, the Anglican chaplain and for other chaplains to be appointed as well um, to, uh, to manage the other denominations and faiths. So why faith in prison? Why do we have chaplains? Why are they so central um, to the life of the prison? Obviously, there are issues around um, human rights um, and equalities, um, but actually chaplaincy can have a really positive effect on offender lives. And a lot of evidence shows that if people are involved within chaplaincy, um, that they'll adjust quicker um, to life in prison. So prison adjustment is certainly helped by faith practice. Through involvement with faith community, you can actually increase motivation to engage um, with other aspects of the prison regime. If someone comes to faith in prison or has a renewal of faith in prison, they're much more likely to see the rest of the regime as having meaning and purpose, rather than just something that gets in the way um, of doing the things that they might want to do. And the faith communities and faith practice allows both repentance and the assurance of forgiveness. Um, which when you are dealing with some of the things that people have done, either lots and lots of small crimes or some really heavy things that actually weigh heavy on people's conscience, it allows the opportunity of change and the possibility of a new narrative in their lives, a new story that can take them into the future and have a crime-free life. And I was really pleased um, to learn a little bit about New Leaf um, which is actually a faith community um, or faith-based project to help in resettlement. And I hope that we pick that up in the Q&A afterwards because it's really, really important. And a very surprising thing is the, the value of chaplaincy as a safe place within prison. Um, Andrew didn't mention, but it was really important, um, the Cardiff Centre for Chaplaincy Studies, um, under Andrew's oversight, conducted some research for us as um, norms on the value of multi-faith chaplaincy, the contribution that it makes. And one of the key findings from that was the value of chaplaincy space, that people, both staff and prisoners, found it a really important to be able to come and share together in that place, which is different from other parts of the prison, is that's how they experienced it. And one of the things that would be really important after Friday prayers or after Sunday service or after whatever act of worship happens is the opportunity for social interaction and that being safe and constructive. And that's really, really important. Just a, a few thoughts about equality. Um, that equality isn't about everyone being the same. Um, the chief rabbi spoke um, very movingly some years ago about the dignity of difference. And I think that for me um, really hit something very important, that equality doesn't mean we're the same, but our differences can be marked by dignity and respect and enrich each other. If you go into a prison, you'll meet a multi-faith chaplaincy team um, there's some of the, the characters you might meet on the wing and uh, at the moment one of the new changes is that recently um, Rastafarian chaplains, um, we, we've not quite got there yet, but Rastafarian practice is now allowed in prison and so that's quite a step forward for us um, as a service. So tomorrow I'll be on the early train to Birmingham to meet with our Rasta faith advisors, so that's, that's been a really exciting change. Is it gone? Ah, yes. there we are. Um, what we have to uh, provide a framework um, for chaplaincy work is a number of, well, for prison service work in general, is a number of prison service instructions. And one of the key ones for chaplains is um, that particular on PSI 51 2011. And if you're really keen to learn about it, go on the Ministry of Justice website and you can download it. Um, but it's actually faith and pastoral care of prisoners. And in summary, that really gives a good feel for what chaplains is about. Chaplains meet the faith needs um, of um, prisoners, ensuring um, religious provision, but also the pastoral care um, of prisoners. And again, in, in the research that, that Andrew looked after for us, what came over very powerfully was the value of the pastoral support that chaplains provide.
<laughs> Please. Yeah. There we are. <clears throat> I'll sit near enough to <laughs> <laughs> move it on. <laughs> so some of the things that the, um, the outcomes that are within that um, PSI that actually we have to provide as chaplains. Um, we have a multi-faith team, and that team should reflect the faith and denominational breakdown of the prison. So it ensures that there's sufficient chaplain time um, to look after the, uh, the various faith communities um, present in the, in the prison itself. We have a number of what are called statutory duties that we have to do each day that are enshrined in the 1952 Prison Act. Um, one of the important ones um, is receptions, which means that whenever anyone comes into prison to begin their sentence, they will be um, met by a chaplain. Um, and that is more than just um, a bureaucratic exercise to check religious registration. Um, it's actually a real opportunity to be alongside someone at a really important point in their life. Um, for some, it'll be their umpteenth time in prison, um, but for others, it might be the start of a very, very long sentence. Um, there will be a whole load of stories that you get on reception. You know, a lad might have just come through, discovered that his girlfriend's pregnant, and suddenly he's got um, put inside. Someone may be starting a sentence, they're 18, 19, 20, but they've actually got a 20-year... You know, so that, that reception visit is really important to help uh, the person adapt to um, what the future will hold for them inside. Um, we also need to ensure that um, everyone has the opportunity for corporate worship or meditation one hour per week. Um, we have, for those who are in um, the segregation or healthcare unit, they have the opportunity for their own separate act of worship if they can't come to the main act of worship. Feast, fasts and festivals are observed and again engaging with members of faith communities from outside is key to the rehabilitative opportunities that prison provides. We mentioned the importance of pastoral provision, and that is really kind of key to the ongoing life um, of, um, of prison chaplaincy and what it contributes. Um, we've mentioned the statute duties. Um, each day someone will visit um, people who are in segregation, in care and separation. And again, that's really important because if you imagine being banged up for 23 hours a day, that actually is quite a challenge to actually how you deal with that in your head. Um, so to have the opportunity to meet with a chaplain, talk through any issues that are rising um, is a really important thing. Again, also a daily visit to those in health care. Um, one of the, the lads I worked with um, very closely uh, who was in healthcare for a long time. He had a very long sentence. Um, he'd been diagnosed with a degenerative condition. And he believed that he was being punished for the things that he'd done by this uh, medical condition. So there was an awful lot to unpack on those regular visits to chat through with him and be alongside him as he came to terms uh, with his illness. We also ensure that each prisoner has the opportunity to meet with a chaplain um, as they prepare for release. Not everyone will take it up, but the whole move towards resettlement is absolutely key um, looking to the future. And as I say, ongoing pastoral support um, to meet with, uh, with prisoners. Those on ACT refers to those who are at risk of self-harm. And OPV is the official prison visitors scheme, um, which allows for those prisoners who don't have regular visits um, to have someone come in as a visitor and um, to meet with them um, and talk about normal things rather than sort of just prison life. <clears throat> but we're not just about providing opportunities for um, religious observance, religious education and so on. Um, we also very often as chaplains run a whole range of other courses and they're just some examples of restorative justice, victim empathy, helping folk realise the impact of their crime living with loss, prisoners face an awful lot of loss when they're inside, and dealing with a death on the inside um, is actually really hard because you feel disconnected from the process that your family's going through on the outside, although we would work hard um, to ensure that a prisoner could attend a funeral unless there were particular security reasons why they couldn't. Relationships, courses, recognising what might have gone wrong in the past, but also looking for how it's going to be in the future. And we provide a lot of staff support 
um, pastoral and religious. Um, so tomorrow in my old prison, it's Ash Wednesday for Christians, and we would have a service for those staff who couldn't go to church outside um, that would uh, allow them to um, share in that. We and uh, really <coughs> just resettlement, resettlement, resettlement. Um, one of the things that um, you'll have read in the press is the move into a new structure for probation services, but that's really about the government's agenda to ensure resettlement is absolutely key um, to the um, journey away from reoffending. And I hope in the Q&A we can talk a bit more about the contribution that faith communities can make to that. And likewise, um, we'll pick this up as well in the Q&A, the importance of working with volunteers and um, to actually help support people inside, but also through the gate. Right, I'm going to focus now on uh, Muslim prisoners and Muslim chaplains and uh, the factors that lead to the numbers of Muslim prisoners that we've got. Uh, first of all, just my role, and I'm the second person to hold this position. The, my, the, the first time that uh, a Muslim advisor was recruited was in 2000, and it was Maksud Ahmad from uh, Leicester who, who took that role on. And, and it's basically recruitment of Muslim chaplains, the endorsement of Muslim chaplains. So um, if you look at the parallel, for example, if an Anglican chaplain is about to step into a prison, there's already a system in place for endorsement in the sense that they've gone through ordination, they're registered, they're on the books and so on. With uh, uh, the whole issue about Muslim imams, etc., there is no hierarchy, there is no set system that we've got in place. So I act as the endorser for any Muslim chaplain imam coming into prison. Um, the training of Muslim chaplains, any discipline issues, and over the last um, sort of eight, nine years, input into the extremism board and extremism issues, uh, guidance on uh, uh, Islamic issues, on uh, policies and various other uh, matters. Uh, the total number of Muslim chaplains, we have 233 Muslim chaplains at the moment registered who work in prisons, uh, 16 Muslim women chaplains, um, 51 full-time, 55 part-time, and 127 sessional. Sessional means they get paid as and when for the hours that they come into the establishment. So they're not employees as such. Now if you compare that with 2004, when I started my job, it's been 10 years, we had 16 employed Muslim chaplains and that was it. There's been a real, a, a real big cultural shift, a paradigm shift if you like in one sense. Um, and it's really the, the, the key person for that was um, um, uh, Mike's predecessor, uh, William Noblet. Um, I, I, I came from outside prison service, so when I look at the, the how, when I arrived with the scenario at that time, it, we, we were quite late in the day to um, embrace the diverse, um, uh, diversity that is there within our prison service. But if, if you look at the sheer numbers, uh, between 16 and we've got 106 employed chaplains, so really, you're looking at, in the last 10 years, we've employed over 90 Muslim chaplains in the service. So it's been a big, big shift. And right across the board, if you look at the whole diversity of the chaplaincy teams, there's a chaplaincy council where all the different faith advisors sit. Um, it, it's quite a wonderful thing to see, especially when, if, if you get a chance, as, as I try and do when I go across to Europe and other, other places, to see how they operate. I mean, I, th I think I'm, I'm quite, so far, all the places I've been, I think we're way ahead of the game in that sense. Uh, we went to Spain, and I, I went with one of their governors, and we're looking at how the Spanish prison system is looking after the Madrid bombers and things like that, and how, how they uh, in interact and what kind of um, security mechanisms they have. The, the prison service head there probably thought I was just a, 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 maybe a governor or something, something like that. So when, the, when, when I asked, how do, you, how do imams fit in, prison imams? He said, well, to be honest with you, they don't, we don't really trust them. And it was quite, quite interesting to see how mainland Europe is 
uh, compared to where Britain is. And I think it's to do with the heritage. In, uh, in England, the moment you, uh, in, 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 here, the moment you, get into, you go into prison, you get asked what religion you are. And you, you mention you've got a big list um, of all the different denominations and different faiths there are. In France, you're not allowed to ask. It's against the law to ask to identify what religion you are. So when I met my counterpart in Paris, um, and he goes into a prison, which are about 4,000 prisoners in his prison, I asked him, how many Muslim prisoners do you look after? And he said, to be honest with you, I don't really know. But I've counted all the Husseins and all the Muhammads and all the Khans and all the... So he's going by names. And uh, that's, that's the best gauge he can get. Um, what do Muslim uh, chaplains do? Well, here's a, a, a list, a very quick list. Friday prayers, one-to-one -one classes, literature, visual presence, um, and I'll go into some aspects of that. Multi-faith presence, assessing reports, advising on local policy. And I think just the fact that you have a Muslim chaplain present in prison sends a big message. And we, we were quite um, concerned when you had um, in, in some areas, no Muslim chaplains at all, no Muslim chaplains coming into prison. And so the Muslim prisoners still were, had to meet, but they appointed one among themselves to lead the prayer, etc. And they're not qualified. Some of them didn't have much knowledge at all. So you, you, know, you got all weird and wonderful uh, views coming out. When I first started, I remember uh, um, a coordinating chaplain, or at that time, um, uh, uh, a chaplain ringing me and saying that, um, is there anything special that I need to do for next week's Eid festival? So I said, there is no Eid festival. Well, what Eid festival? Because don't you have Eid six times a year? <laughs> so, you know, I think Muslim prisoners took full advantage of the fact that there wasn't anybody there. Um, so it stops prisoners assuming the role. There's great respect, um, more likely to ask the imam if he's there. And you occasionally get, if, they, if a prisoner is put on the pedestal, so you sometimes get a Muslim chaplain might be told, but the other imam says, well, which other imam? It's president of such and such on cell block, whatever. Um, visual multi-faith presence, a priest, imam together walking the wings sends a really powerful message. And it, it takes us away from the us and them culture that is um, unfortunately sometimes um, uh, there. Friday prayer, sermon, um, you've got a captive audience. Uh, they can't, as you know, from a religious perspective, they can't really move or speak. They, they, they listen to the khutbah. All the Friday sermons, the, um, although they are in Arabic, there has to be a lesson in English, a bayan, or the sermon itself has to be in English. Now, that's something which most prisoners don't get. And the number of times in the last 10 years a, a Muslim prisoner said to me, I'm about to be released, but can I ask, why is it that I have to come to prison to hear a sermon in English? Uh, and this is, a, a, you know, the, the state of affairs that is outside, unfortunately. One-to-one uh, -one sessions, walking the wings, you target any particular vulnerable people, um, you analyze their position, their stance, and, and most of the imams are theologically equipped to handle most of the uh, questions that come up. Uh, you're responsible for literature and artifacts, so you assess what currently uh, is in possession, etc. Giving out mainstream material to make sure that people don't get swayed by um, odd uh, literature or fringe material. And we're creating also at the same time basic material for prisoners. Uh, classes, um, if I told you that one of our Muslim prisoners does eight classes a week, so it all varies from one class a week at least to you know, quite a few. Um, syllabus, each imam is responsible for their own syllabus, so they, they tailor it to their particular congregation. But we've also designed our first ever uh, uh, course, Tarbiya course one, Iman to Islam, eye to eye it's called. And we've currently had about 2,000 Muslim prisoners go through that. So it's just to help, it's just another, another uh, feature to help imams um, take their prisoners through particular courses. And supporting new converts is another. Um, assessing concerns. Um, so one very important factor which is missing actually in many mainland European um, countries, prison services, is the ability to 
delineate pious behavior from extremist behavior. And it's very, very important because you get it wrong, actually sends the wrong message out. And you could, you, you could increase um, extremism if you get it wrong. Um, so again, the imam is very crucial in that. So uh, sometimes the security governor might ask the imam in a prison, what do you think of this, is this? And he'll say, well, actually, there's nothing wrong with that or whatever, or that's just, or he might flag up concerns. Um, extremism has become more and more part of our uh, remit. Um, I think at the same time, prisoners get, extremist prisoners get shocked by the good treatment that they get because they don't expect it. I think they probably are weaned on stories of abuse and um, torture that many of their predecessors uh, and still do receive in the Middle East in jails. Um, but if you look at all the different um, uh, services that are on offer to them, we had recently a gathering of uh, prison staff from Jordan, Saudi, um, Turkey, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, and in sheer numbers of resources and what we, what we offer, we outdid all of them. And I think that it was a big shock to their system because they're in Muslim countries. They've got the whole backing of a Muslim government, yet they, many of them did not even employ imams to go into uh, prisons. They were often from the voluntary sector. Many didn't have syllabuses. Let, I mean, they were just absolutely gobsmacked. The Jordanian government then put in a... a uh, a request to buy our tarbiya system. <laughs> I was saying, you know, we're here living in the UK, you're there, you've got all your scholars and you haven't even developed um, a, a course, a simple course. Uh, we've also now you know, in the process of completing a targeted course, one-to-one, -one, it's called the Ibana program, intervention, and that looks at debunking, uh, de-radicalizing key extremist ideological narratives, going through the delil or the evidence base for extremism and debunking that. I'm responsible for training of Muslim chaplains. We've had four residential training programs over the last eight years. One is scheduled this year. Um, we've used different scholars from around the uh, world. We've invited them over to give different, widen the scope. We created documents of what to do if to try and help them cope. Um, and, and, and so on. Um, now, one of the aspects I wanted to uh, cover, uh, I was asked to cover also, is why is there an increase in Muslim prisoners? I mean, when I started, uh, we had about 7,000 Muslim prisoners. We've now gone up to about 11, 11 and a half thousand. Um, about 13% of the prison population is Muslim currently. One reason is this. This graph is singularly responsible for all the Muslim prisoners. Um, this is a demographic um, um, chart. If you look at the, the profile of Muslim population in the UK, they're mainly, I mean, 50% of all Muslims, or 52%, I can't remember the exact figure, of all Muslims in the UK are below the age of 25. So when you look at it from that perspective, and we've already, you go into any uh, uh, criminology department, you'll know that there is a, uh, crime and youth, there's a, a link, link to that. So that's one, one aspect. Um, then now here's my doom and gloom bit. This is the, where I personally feel the community is or was. And if you look at it, there's a gross amount of disunity, different denominations. I come from Halifax, we've got seven mosques and um, they've been there for maybe about 30, 40 years. And those imams in all seven mosques have never ever met because they come from different denominations. So if the Anglican Church and the Catholic Church thought they had it bad, I mean, you have to come to us. <laughs> a caste, tribes, mosques based on uh, uh, nationalities. Uh, we have a calcified, what I call a calcified fiqh, uh, uh, parrot fashion scholarship. Um, and people don't delineate between sincerity and scholarship often. We're very, very intolerant as a community of different opinions. Um, and uh, people, people's level of knowledge of Islam is very limited. Not clear what is fixed, what is changeable in the Sharia, and not understanding Sunnah. I was in Newcastle University, is where I did my first degree. And 
I, we had, um, I remember coming into uh, prayer and I was a, a bit late and I noticed um, two, two, two men sat there in the library not praying. I'd seen them, they're part of the congregation. So I finished prayer and I went up and I said, you know, you didn't join in, is there a reason? So back in my zealous days. And one of them, and he's a doctor, he's a postdoctorate in, um, in Newcastle University. He said, no, I don't, I don't pray behind Sheikh Saeed, the Imam. I said, why? He said, because he wears a tie. I said, so what's wrong with wearing a tie? He goes, the Prophet, salam, peace be upon him, never wore a tie. I said, brother, the Prophet never wore trousers that, like you're wearing. He goes, but I'm not an Imam. <laughs> so I was thinking, you know, how, how do I argue this? So I said, look, do you believe the Imam has to wear what the, um, uh, what the Prophet wore? He goes, yes. So I said, okay, if an Eskimo in Alaska becomes Muslim, do you want him to take off his woolen boots and wear sandals? Because that's what the Prophet, peace be upon him, wore. He goes, if he did that, it would be better for him. I said, you're a doctor. He'd die of exposure. He said, don't say die, he'd be a martyr. And so, you know, when I think to myself, I was thinking, and I remember at that time thinking, you, you're doing a post-doctorate. You know, there's going to be a doctor by your name. And yet, basic concept of sunnah, understanding the sunnah you don't have. And it seems, you know, I find so many intellectuals who are doing very well in their academic field, but when it comes to Islam, they just sort of bend their brain and just absorb whatever comes, unfortunately. Um, ritual versus essence, uh, I, I think we're very much, as a community, very much um, concerned about the superficial, not the substance as much, and we need to go back into the spiritual aspects of our religion. There is a big mosque gap, although certain communities are doing far better than others. My community, where I come from, isn't at all. It's been 40, 50 years since there's been a mosque where I come from, and to this day, the language for the sermon and even for the bayan is not English. So most of the youth who come to our mosque come there, sit there, listen to virtually to, to a language they don't understand, and go away having learned nothing for the Friday sermon. Um, most mosques don't teach Arabic. People think they teach Arabic, they don't. They teach how to pronounce Arabic uh, alphabet and Arabic words without understanding it. And of course, we, our community has got a few idiots and extremists around, and here are a few of them, who've got lovely sentiments drawn on the um, dysfunctional families, education, uh, uh, lack of male role models often, many constraints for women, so it's quite interesting. I gave a talk in Bradford University recently, and it was quite surprised to see 90% of the Islamic society, they invited me to do a talk, 90% of the audience were women and maybe a few guys and I was straggling along. That's quite interesting to see because a lot of women are using Islam as a sort of almost emancipating um, tool. Generation gap, uh, different moralities, for example, the concept of sharm or shame is different. Identity issues, lack of youth facilities, Growing secularism and materialistic outlook, lack of employment, especially up north. Uh, a lot of um, ghettos and silos, which is what one thing that we did when the Cantle report of the um, riots in 2001 was quite interesting to see within a, a, a re really about two, three mile distance. You had kids growing up, going to a state nursery where it's 100% Muslim kids going to a primary school with 100% Muslim kids, then going to a secondary school with 100% Muslim kids because of the catchment area system. And then when they come out at 18, they never had a non-Muslim friend. And then, of course, um, they're blamed that they don't integrate. But that's the system. Uh, growing antagonism, uh, media far right, a lot, of, a lot of youth really frightened about uh, the growing anti-Muslim um, um, uh, uh, anti-Muslim elements out there. Uh, channeling frustration is quite, quite important, and I think a lot of youth feel quite frustrated with what's going on outside. Um, demonization of Islam, self-esteem, and a lot of things resonate then. 
And this is Osama bin Laden's famous 1997 fatwa. In what creed are your dead considered innocent but ours worthless? By what logic does your blood count as real and ours no more than water? And that resonates. And so, you know, that when you're frustrated, when there's no, you know, the, the elements around you are, are quite uh, are poor, you can't move on, then these kind of things do um, attract. And this is from Muhammad Sadiq Khan, who's the, of course, one of the um, uh, bombers in the, of the underground. And it's interesting, again, how he views scholars our so-called mosque scholars of today who are content with their Toyotas and semi-detached houses because there's a mismatch between what he saw in the mosque and they weren't relevant to him, unfortunately. And lastly, this is some things that we teach us from our Tarbiya uh, course. Um, and it's just basic virtues. I mean, our Tarbiya course is nothing to do with how many times you have to um, wash your arm for wudu or salah. It's nothing to do with that. It's about basic moral, morality and ethics in Islam. So, we, you know, teaching about um, by God he cannot be a believer, by God he cannot be a believer, by God he cannot be a believer. He was asked who, and the Prophet ﷺ said, he from whose misdeeds his neighbor is not safe. And these are just slides taken from the Tarbiya course. A Muslim is one from whose tongue and hand mankind is safe, and a believer is one in whom people place their trust in regard to their life and wealth. Okay, and that's it, thank you very much.